a very good afternoon to you all and uh, most welcome to Heidegger 918 we are uh, getting closer to sundown here and today I will talk about fractality I think that is a very good way of approaching uh, this deconstruction of the regular uh, dimensions first what are the fractals yeah they were discovered by a fellow called Benoit Mandelbrot and uh, they are actually the real dimensions of uh, what we call um, the universe or the earth or whatever we thought until uh, the event of fractals that reality was constructed in uh, three orthogonal from uh, uh, three orthogonal planes uh, each one with a 90 degrees difference to the other one but it turned out it is not the construction of the universe it is fractals and they run in between what we thought to be the secure dimensions this could be the last blow to the uh, Pit Pitafugarian uh, solids uh, and it's also a huge blow to the old age geometry because it actually questions the whole idea of dimensionality to be that simple or uh, as we are used to that there is a plane going inside and this one going upside and then you have depth instead space is irregular always irregular at every plane at every scale we find irregularities and they are oddly enough self-similar in character and this self-similarity -similar in space run across scale it's another odd feature because we usually think that when we make a scale comparison there is an absolute and very important difference but fractals shows that difference not to be uh, as we usually think oddly enough this is also something questioned by the physicist uh, Julian Barber uh, Julian Barber uh, sorry I was thinking of uh, David Babbage Julian Barber uh, which you can I can recommend you have a look at him at YouTube is most frequent there and um, he shows that scale doesn't really exist in the universe to have scale you have to you have to have an inert point of reference and although the debate uh, in the early 18th century even late uh, 17th century run high whether such a inert point of reference was possible uh, we now know it is an impossibility and therefore we cannot have a sort of an origo or a starting point in the universe where we can compare scales so all of a sudden from a large perspective this whole idea of scale disappear but also from the rather a bit more usual perspective uh, we also understand that scale is impossibility because that would take three dimensions that are orthogonal but such a thing doesn't really exist one famous example is the coastline of uh, n uh, Norway if you magnify the coastline only to the scale I think it's like five kilometers the equivalence of three English miles the coast of Norway is larger than the coast of Africa the coast of Africa is much too regular very few natural harbors especially on the uh, west side of Africa and that makes it uh, 
to have less of a coastline than Norway. And that goes for many things in our normal reality. Plants, for instance, have extensive uh, surface because there is a scale somewhere in between dimension one and two and also one between two and three and they usually go ad infinitum they go to infinity very quickly another examples are uh, rivers and clouds clouds are very typically completely fractal with uh, infinite area so to speak so what sort of properties do these uh, building blocks of the universe have? The true arche of the universe. Well, one distinguishing feature of fractal is its, uh, their properties of self-similarity. So they have a substructure that is analogous or at least very similar to an overall structure. Uh, one famous example is the common fern. If you magnify it and you get lower down, you will find the same shape turning up over and over again. But if you zoom out and you make the fern smaller and smaller from a distance, you will have the very same effect self-similarity on a very large scale. Most probably this is the working of space all over the place, wherever you are on the scale, if there even is such a thing as a scale. Because remember this, where the zoom is coming from, think about a telescope or a film camera. If you zoom in and you zoom out, also the film camera is fractal and the light is fractal. So there is fractality uh, sort of coercing with fractality. And you cannot find a true origin, so to speak, this whole idea of a presence that is non-defined, non-specific, and just a blank, I usually call it. That doesn't exist because you have fractality on both sides. And I think a good example is actually uh, the coastline I mentioned before of Norway or, or it could be Africa. Think about the relationship between the sea and the coastline. When I say coastline, I mean the, the sort of uh, mainland, the ground. But that also goes for the water, the sea. Because of the coastline having fractality, also the sea will have fractality. And that means that the sea is corresponding or interacting with the coastline. So both are participating in fractality. And the more complexity you find in the land, the more complexity you will also find in the sea. So it goes both ways and it seemed to ignore the common division that we usually make between inside and outside. It goes across and it intermingles. It doesn't seem to observe that regularity which I, we find in re, uh, normal geometry. The interactiveness is in, just incredible. And this, this self-similarity also goes for the coastline. There is a self-similarity in whatever scale you are actually working at. So this is a copying to the, uh, from the larger to the bigger, but also from the smaller to the bigger, or from the smaller to the even smaller. And... Uh, I really like this because it works in mathematics as, as well. The Feigenbaum constant is a constant that turns up in all levels of mathematics. Despite what sort of equations you are doing, 
the scale of equations and the Feigenbaum constant can even turn up in the calculator as well in how it's constructed. So these oddities of geometry, topology and mathematics I would say are just sure, nothing short of astonishing. But they're also helpful in sort of deconstructing what is space. And as you will see later, that can also be brought over to time itself. But later uh, I will talk about that. Another important characteristic or aspects of fractals are that they is that they are infinite and it seems that this very infinity is not only a characteristic it seems to be the essence of what space is it is seem to be the force of space the infinity and i think Previously, we thought that infinity was a sort of a construct going somewhere else or something extra. But it turns out infinity is the groundedness of space to space, be, that space could be able to work at all. It needs to be infinite. One should compare that to to the old geometry where infinity was never the case. Nothing was infinite. Uh, for the old Greek, not even the universe was infinite. They didn't like infinity. It was actually part of the apeiron, the feared thing for the Greeks to have infinity. It was scary looking like zero or emptiness. And uh, I think that's a good pointer. Everything that you sort of divide with zero goes directly to infinity. And here you can see that there is actually some sort of fraternity between nothing and infinity. Both those things were assumed to be off limits for thinking, not any good. And this zooming out and zooming in has two very, very amazing uh, um, attributes, especially for me who, who likes uh, amateur photography. And is think about the, the zoom. The zoom is very helpful to understand fractals. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. And for each time you do that, you do something intentionally and thereby you change the universe. Normally, in normal space, we think it is just change of zoom. Reality remains as it is. We just magnified it. But when it comes to fractals, it changes everything. The zooming in actually makes the fractals literally different. So they are not mere repetitions, they are iterations. So when you zoom in, it's no longer the same world. And this also show that the observer, the zoom of whatever you call him or her or it, is actively participating in the making of reality. And that is another most amazing aspect with fractals. They are participatory, as I call it. Uh, this is something uh, Diego Lucio Rapoport would call uh, interpenetrative, but it is the same thing. It is the matryoshkas once more that goes goes into each other, and this is the third property of space. It is always interpenetrative. So each area of space goes to each other area of space. Oddly enough, this actually sounds a uh, quite a bit uh, like deconstruction of a text to show that each part of the text belongs to the other part of the text. Or why not a song or a melody where each little part is interactive with each other part. Otherwise there wouldn't be a song or a tune. 
and they are of course also fractal. So the listener and the ear of the listener or the sensing organ to listen into music is also fractal. Once more you have the coastline and the sea constantly interacting with each other and making something we call reality. It is this really uh, interactiveness that is reality. With only one side without the camera, the fractality in itself cannot even be fractal. It cannot come into existence. And when we talk about dimension, we get a more specific definition for dimension. Dimension in the regular coordinate system of uh, Pascal or Cartesius are more like hypotheses. You don't really know what they are or what they, uh, how they exist. The fractal dimension, on, on the other hand, are actually defined by an equation. It is n equals r uh, on the level of d, where d is dimensionality, and this is called the Hausdorff formula. n is the number of self-similar pieces, and r is the number of division of the initiator. And that means you actually measure the scale from the complexity. So the mere complexity is dimension. And this is something I mentioned before that actually changes the very concept of reality. Before uh, we used to think reality is having a pure origin from the Big Bang or a causal series of sort and uh, how do you uh, dis discern real re reality from illusion uh, the film matrix I mentioned before is a good example the filmmakers the scripts maker they thought that there could be like a perceptible or uh, an ontic reality difference between what Neo, for instance, is experience within the Matrix and when he gets out to real life. That is usually shown in the movie that he starts to sweat in real life and it, it feels real and those things. This is actually not true. Uh, uh, people who are working with fractals were actually advising in the movie and they're advised against this because it's not true. To fractality. Uh, what is real is actually measurable. It is the infinity of the fractality that makes reality. And that is impossible to construct in the gigantic computer of the matrix. So the move is in itself an impossibility. Still, it's a very pleasurable movie, but it's very important to remember that, that reality can't be made by a computer. Because the computer has to be much bigger than the universe, no matter what. And it goes to infinity, because it cannot be constructed. It's an oddity of fractality. It puts a limit to imagination. And I would say it is a normal limit also to what we can sort of figure out. We have to, when we think, follow the rules of fractality. That means that we're actually constructing when we think, rather than just imagining. That is a fractality in self. Because thoughts are, as such, fractal. They are not geometrical shapes. I think we could take a little break there. There are some applications to fractals and one of the things we can actually find here is anybody wonder why the modern mobile phone doesn't have an antenna? It is because the antenna in the mobile is actually fractal. 
and the very size with the old antenna on the mobile would go to infinity almost. It would be very, very long. Uh, since the discovery of fractals, we've been using uh, fractality to sort of compress uh, antennas into the mobiles and other communication uh, tools like uh, radio masts and uh, towers and similar things. Another thing is within computer science and I mention this also because in computer science we get a clue in understanding how fractal works. By fractality we can actually compress photographs and even before we work with photographs we could have compressed photographs but then we lost some feature when we decompressed. The oddity, when we enlarged a fractally compressed photo, which is like less in size when it comes to megabyte or gigabyte or whatever, we don't lose anything. How odd is not that? So you see here how it is implicitly possible from the same amount of bits to sort of expand it to become more bits. Isn't that amazing? I think that is one of the hardest things to understand. Although in every mobile in the world that is happening, that sort of compression is going on. Uh, and this compressioning thing is always a fact when it comes to fractal space is always present and this of course also applies to music when we compress music and we noticed uh, after the discovery of fractality that many great uh, composers and in this case especially one have been looking into the musical works of Haydn it turned out he'd be using extensively uh, what is called fractal comp uh, compression when doing his music. So you could actually play it slower and get more tune of the same concerto. So that's also amazing. You could take another pause. Now we go over to time. Uh, time, oddly enough, is also fractal. And that is something has, that has been discovered in a new science called chronobiology and that is our hmm, what can we call it inner clock or endogenous clock and oddly enough it's not really situated in us because it has a sort of a synchronizing correlative structure <coughs> this is coming from <coughs> Susie Froble page 30 uh, first we have something called the circadian rhythm which is <coughs> roughly a 24-hour cycle of uh, physiological processes. That is the circadian rhythm but oddly there is another ryth rhythm called the ultradian rhythm and also an Euphradian rhythm that are nested in a fractal way. So we have at least three different rhythm in this nesting system or overlapping system. Uh, they also constitute a sort of a rhythm. And this form a very complex chronobiological pattern in which different rhythms are coupled. Simple ratios of frequencies such as 4 to 1 occur frequently, for instance, in the pulse, pulse respiratory quotient during the early morning hours, but also during meditation. When we look at entrainment, where internal rhythms lock into external ones and sometimes produce a fractal rhythm, in the shape of harmonics, we take it for granted that our bodies 
or other living systems can actually produce nested rhythms. So off and gone is this old model that we just perceive time without any explanation whatsoever what that could be to perceive time. And now we know that we have our own fractality and that is an absolute necessity to be in concord with the exogenous time, the external time, so to speak, which is not completely external. And the, it, this is this cohesion between external and eternal in different pulses, overlapping, being nested into each other, which is time. There is no other time. So it can't be time without the fractality coming from the endogenous side. That shows that the old idea that time is just out there and happens by itself uh, has fallen even within mathematics itself, or fractality. I think that is most interesting. And this also shows the interactiveness of the subject into what could be the object, that there is an interpenetration going on. And that's another way of saying that there are two different fractalities. They are both incredibly complex and ready structure before the interaction, so to speak, before, if there is a before. And in this nestedness that happens when the internal uh, meets the external, the endogenous goes into the endogenous, then we get this objective time which is shared by everyone. Um, this is of course a completely different take of time compared to Newton and even Einstein. In all aspects, every concept of time that I found when I was looking through the internet for one hour are in the old model where we never mention who is perceiving the time in what way is it perceived it's just a blank spot where we say it is being perceived and that's it nothing more but that simply won't do anymore we need to understand the understanding principle and that cannot be a complete blank that we usually seem to see the perceiving subject to be. And it cannot either have that complete internal thing because then it couldn't interact with the external. It need to be nested in each other. Otherwise, it cannot be readout. And it's only this readout that can be shared so all of a sudden, all this idea of an external world where we get objectivity somehow, and that is situated somewhere close to the star of Alpha Centauri or in some made-up world called Nangiala. That's out of the picture completely. It's gone. Uh, another thing is we need distortions to get this system to work. So this is also very similar to chaotic theory. In chaos theory, it shows that for a system to be uh, steady, persistent, and resilient, distortions are a very, very important factor. Fractality is the geometrical side of uh, chaos systems, and they show this very effect of scalelessness and when you scale down or you zoom in you get all this complexity. This is similar to the disturbances that makes the system work. And you can say the shared time we have uh, is at the same time an internal chaos system but it's also an external chaos system. And the more you get into your eternal time the more is shared by others. So in some ways, the whole idea of subject objects is turned on its head. Sometimes it's reversed and sometimes it's completely turned on its head. And this is very important also to understand quantum mechanics. I won't get into that 
right now. But I see already the potentiality to explain quantum mechanics in a much simpler way, that the subject is not wholly uh, external to reality, it's not coming from some other place, it's actually in the world and it's doing things that are very similar to what's happening in the external world. And that's helping a lot and it would have helped a lot with the conversation um, this uh, chat, the interviewer of uh, Ian McKilkis did uh, mark something uh, with Ian McKilkis earlier. Uh, a video I already promised to link, so I have better do that. Well, I see that is quite enough for today. I say thank you very much and I wish you a pleasant evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.